Hello, everybody, and Happy New Year! Apparently, it is 2022. Uh, Zandy and I are in living in the past, though. It's still early November. The holidays have not begun. But I hope everyone's having a, uh, a happy new year. Zandy, have you prepared a timely resolution at all? Or is what do you think you're up to on this New Year's weekend? Oh, man. Uh, probably up to nothing too special. Uh, I have a, I'll be traveling to Minnesota soon for a, uh, a live show that one of my Fun. favorite podcasts is doing. Um, it's What's the podcast? A, and that's why we drink. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I really fell for that. <laughs> January 6th. Very excited for that show. But um, yeah, no, I will be, I don't know, actually, I was just talking to my little sister about New Year's, and I have no idea what I'll be doing. I have no real plans. Um, I have a girlfriend who lives in New York, very much not doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, New York, New Year's sounds terrifying. She won't be there anyway. Um, So I don't know. I'll probably just be chilling, not doing too much, but hopefully living my best life. You know, I, I've always thought that a New York New Year's would be fun. And I went, I must have been 16. My mom was like, oh, let's all go together and have a, a New York time. And we did like the parade or is there a parade on New Year's or whatever, when the ball I drops and no all that. Idea. Yeah. It was the really chaotic thing where like, if you're a claustrophobic, don't go, you know? <laughs> and uh, yeah. And so... I remember thinking at 16, I was like, I never have to do this again in my entire life. Uh, I'm never going to be here. And same with, uh, I did the Thanksgiving parade. I think my mom wanted me to have those moments instead of just see them on TV. But I'm glad she did them early because I might always wonder what if. And if you're wondering what if, let me tell you, it's very scary. It's uh, You're like really like crunched up against people. So if that's your vibe, though, have a great time. But I'm happy to not uh, partake in that. I think for New Year's this year... I usually am I'm home for Christmas and it always a kind of I end up coming home the day after New Year's like the New Year's party. So actually right now as you're listening to this people I'm probably on a plane coming home. Oh, ex- exciting. <laughs> exciting. And then in 4 days we start our tour again. So actually uh shout out for me and Christine. Um if you are coming to our next show, please be nice to us because this is our first show we've done in the last uh two years (laughs) so or this is the first show we've done in two years so um please be sweet to us please applaud very loudly actually i know where what i'm doing january 2nd and i'm flying to your area your neck of the woods because christine and i are having a whole weekend of rehearsal oh i didn't know that that's exciting i know so anyway that i can be there and practice being nice because i i I will try not to be too mean at that show (laughs) well i'll we will be the propranol all will be sky high. Um, <laughs> uh, no, but we will be. This is our first week of our tour. It's super exciting, and our show is really, really good. I just hope that I'm not too rusty after a while. So I've never seen it. I I I, I, oh I planned gosh. to go to the Minnesota show last time, and I had a, I had an Airbnb booked. I was about to book a flight, and that was right when COVID hit. And I thought, okay, this is probably a terrible idea. And then it got canceled anyway. Uh, oh. The show. So. Um, well, oh my gosh, you're gonna love it. Well, I I'm think excited. you're gonna love it. This is like one of the only times in my life, and I think Christine can agree that, like, with confidence, I know people will enjoy the show. It's like not even a, a maybe. Why? Why the Minnesota show? I have a friend. Uh, my friend Stephen lives up there, uh, oh, and fun. I. I've, he's someone who I've been friends with for like, I don't know, over ten years or about ten years. And I uh, have only met him in person like three or four times. We're like I love that. video game friends. I was talking to him like five minutes ago before we started <laughs> recording. So we're like talking every day, playing RuneScape together. But um, I, yeah, always try to find a, an excuse to see him. So I'm very excited for that. So he'll be there too. Oh, awesome. I love a good online friend. I, yep. <laughs> um, my, our, my roommate, RJ, he, uh, most of his friends seem to be online and I know when he's having a good day when I can hear him screaming through the walls at other people he's <laughs> probably never met. Okay, anyway, I've got a story for you, Zandy. This isn't very New Year's themed, but it was recommended. Um, so I'm just going to give the people what they want. And I'm also excited because for some reason, I know that Savannah and probably coming up on like Uh, Charleston, South Carolina, they usually are fighting for the spot of like most haunted place in the country. 
And mm. yet I can never find a Savannah story or I can never find a Savannah story with enough like meat to, that's the biggest struggle I always deal with is so many people will send in stories and I, they're just not long enough. So I just can't cover it as a topic, but I found a Savannah one and um, I hope people are happy with me finally. And it is the old pink house. My, my grandpa lives in one of those. His Does house he? is like from the, I don't know, 19th century. It's some, so like early 19th century, I think. And it's extremely pink. But this is in Germany. It's not in Georgia. So Is is there a reason why it's pink? Because this there's um, a reason why this house is pink. I don't know. I don't know the history behind it. But that's why he bought it. He really liked the color. <laughs> you know, the, I've mentioned this before in... Um, on our show, but there's a pink house in Fredericksburg. It's literally known as the pink house and my mom is obsessed with it. And, uh, one of my step siblings ended up dating a kid whose family member owned the pink house. And so my mom finally had an in to see the pink house for herself. <laughs> and we've lived here. We've lived in Fredericksburg since the nineties. Every month I'm hearing a new update about the pink house. Like, Oh, they did new shutters or, Oh, <laughs> Oh, the landscapers at the pink house. And so, it took 20 years, but she finally had her in for a moment. And it, Aww, I, it happy was, for her. It was, it was a small town dream. And so, anyway, this is not that pink house. If, if you're listening, uh, people who I know who own the pink house, please uh, let me know if there's any ghosts there. And my mom will, I don't know, her head will fall off. She'll be so excited. Okay. So this is in Savannah. It's uh, one of the top-rated restaurants in Savannah. I looked at their menu, and I don't know if this is a common thing on their menu, but it is, It was, maybe it was a special, but I saw a fried green tomato BLT, which uh, I'm, I love a good fried green tomato, and I love a good BLT, so smush those together, it sounds like a party. Do you have a favorite southern food, by the way, Sandy? Uh, now that I'm vegan, not really. Um, fair there what was, did you used to love well so actually no i'll say i'll say this there's a place in la called doomies um so not in the south but they do a lot of like i don't know southern fair i would say it's a lot of fried chicken and stuff i love a good vegan fried chicken or fried chicken and waffles things like that i love fried chicken and waffles i went to a i was just in new york and i went to a brunch place specifically for their vegan fried chicken and waffles and they said they don't really? make it anymore, so I was really disappointed. But wait, you traveled all that distance to get told that they don't exist anymore? It was like a twenty-minute walk, but oh, sorry, <laughs> but like... in my head it felt like a quest. <laughs> no, 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 sorry, I meant yeah, I was already in New York. I see, and then while oh, in New York, okay. picking brunch places, I was like, oh, I want to go there because of it. Uh, their fr vegan fried chicken and waffles, and alas, they didn't do it anymore. So. You really that's one could, of my you, favorite things. That story sounded like it could have like been an adventure, though, of like I traveled across the seas, <laughs> like a Harold and Kumar, but this time it's for yeah. vegan fried chicken and waffles. <laughs> it's, it doesn't have the same ring to it, but I'm sure you get this question a thousand times, and for all I know, it's like offensive to vegans. But is there a food you miss that you you wish you had anymore? I thought there would be, but not really. Hmm. Probably early on, sure. There are some snacks when I found out, like, oh, man, those aren't vegan. Like, I don't know, silly things like, I don't know, M&Ms or Starbucks. Like, just random things. I'm like, darn it. You know, I wish I could eat those. But it's been two years. A week from now, it'll be two years. And I honestly don't miss anything. And because most wow. things, there is a substitute for it anyway. That tastes um, good. Cause I'm, yeah, I, I think so. That's my bit. I'm just like so weirdly picky about I can't find alternatives that taste mm -hmm. good sometimes. Yeah, no. To me, at least, they taste good. And it's also, I feel like it hasn't been very restrictive. If anything, it's kind of opened up how I eat because I've explored more options and hmm. realized like, oh, okay. Like, I've never had all these different types of tofu. <laughs> I mean, and yeah, tofu to <laughs> most people sounds gross, but, you know, if it's cooked well. And there's so many different ways to prepare it, so... I don't know. It's just, it's weirdly opened up how I eat, and I think I eat a lot more variety now that I am vegan compared to before. Huh. For for new vegans, do you have like a favorite uh, snack or something that they can explore for the first time? Oh gosh, for the first time, um, I usually like, stick to the ones. What was the one ones... that blew your mind? Like that it was vegan, or just like a new thing that. A new thing. Gosh, a new thing? I don't know. I didn't mean to put you... This isn't like, you know, the vegan I talk show, but this. I just... Because, like, my go-to snacks are still, like, Red Vines, Oreos, you know, things that you... Like, the accidental vegan things, Sour Patch Kids. Right. 
Um, Sour Patch Kids are vegan? Yeah. And oh, one wow. thing that I was shocked by is movie theater popcorn butter is vegan because it's just oil for the most part. I would look into it. I don't take my word for all of this, but yeah. Oh, I will. going back though, thing I miss, candy corn. I think because I think we have heard have been, of, we've heard about that. <laughs> people DM me were like about it because you talked about this on the show. Still, I, I don't know. No one has come to me with a vegan candy corn option. See, I can't judge a vegan, but I sure can judge someone who likes candy corn. So we're now going to quickly move on. You've lost your your privilege to talk about veganism. Fair, okay, fair. so it's the top rated restaurant in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, again, uh, BLT fried green tomatoes. It is not vegan. So sorry, Zandy. <laughs> but it's in Reynolds Square, which I guess is one of the oldest corners of the city. Uh, it was established in 1734. And the house was originally called the Habersham House. So it was built by merchant James Habersham Jr. And I'm I'm going to commit to that version because there's... I was getting confused because his father keeps getting mentioned when people try to talk about James's background. So I feel like a few articles I read, a lot of my sources end up being like haunted blogs because like there's no real like mm-hmm. solid sources for ghost stories. But I think a lot of people were equally getting confused. And so some of the stories were starting that the house was owned by James Habersham Sr. and not James Habersham Jr. But I, I'm i pretty sure it was James Jr. And they kept bringing up his father because James and his two brothers named Joe and John, so they had a letter thing going on, uh, they were all three... Uh, they were all fighting for independence during the Revolutionary War, and their father was loyal to the crown. And so there was mm. this local drama between, like, the dad and his three sons, like, not getting along because they had very different political views. Um, I think a lot of people here can uh, say, wow, that uh, aligns with my current life because I, I have seen in a few of the Facebook groups that a lot of people are currently dealing with their parents, especially when I covered the QAnon episodes. Yeah. So anyway, history repeats itself and our dads all have weird politics. So go figure. <laughs> so it was built by James Habersham Jr. Uh, and his father is, I guess, not involved in the story beyond that history of James's life. And J- so this is where I get confused again because people were saying, oh, well, James Sr. was really uh, was really rich. He was one of the richest people in the colonies. And I was like, he was loyal to the crown, so I don't know what's going on here. I'm just running with James Jr. the whole time. Okay. He was one of the richest people in the colonies. He owned a cotton plantation. Yikes. And uh, he was the first guy to actually start sending cotton to Britain. Wait, so maybe it was his dad. Ah, oh, fuck. Okay. Um, <laughs> and either way, so far, like, not loving this guy that he's got a no, cotton plantation. Doesn't sound good. The only, like, green flag of, of him is that he started uh, the country's first orphanage. So, when some That's lose so random. Yeah, it's like, oh, I'm glad you... I'm glad you're doing something good. Yeah, <laughs> but how do, how do you how do you do that? I honestly don't know. It seems so yeah, not that I, I expect an answer there. I'm just like even in today's world, I wouldn't know how to do something like that. Yeah, <laughs> like it wasn't like this wasn't like a social worker who's like, let's find a better way to do things. This was like a cotton plantation owner. Yeah, um, who was like, let's start an orphanage. What? Right. Huh. It feels like um, you care a lot about certain people, but not others. But anyway, whatever. Mm-hmm. His brother Joe, he was apparently the most famous of the three brothers because he actually was one of the men who marched into the british governor's mansion and arrested him so for history buffs the we're talking about that guy's brother for the story james helped fund the revolutionary war's effort by being a merchant he had a lot of connections and that's how he was able to help the effort or help fund the effort and he later served as a speaker of the general assembly of georgia and also he was on the board of trustees uh and they later helped establish the University of Georgia. Oh. Fun fact. Did you know that the Board of Trustees, uh, I know this is the Board of Trustees for Georgia, so I don't know if it's, it's probably not the same. But in a small town, did, or like a small city, did you know that the Board of Trustees, being the president of the board of a city, is the equivalent of today's mayor? I did not. Yeah. 
So oh. now if you're a mayor, you can just use the old school verbiage of I'm on, I'm on, I'm the president of the board of Burbank. I don't know. Interesting. Okay. I only know that because the tavern in my city uh, used to belong to the mayor of Burbank, but at the time he went by the president of the board of trustees. So fun fact for everybody. That is a fun s- fact. If you see that on a historical marker in any capacity, know that it's just a mayor. So uh, in the middle of him building his home, because it took from 1771 to 1789, it's 18 years. The reason it took him so long was because in the middle of him building his home, it was occupied by British forces. So he ended up having to hold off on building the rest of his home until after the Revolutionary War, which is ironic that they were British soldiers occupying his home when he was like not loyal to the crown. So. Mm -hmm. Ten years after it was finally completed, James allegedly died under suspicious, mysterious circumstances. Ooh. And there are two camps with James's death, and that he did, in fact, have a, a, a suspicious death, or that he just died. And like, it's not that it's like not that crazy of a story, because the rumor is he walked in on his wife sleeping with their architect from when they were building the house. And he was so distraught that he died by suicide by hanging himself in the basement. Others say there were different reasons why he did this. Either the wife died and he was overcome with grief or something like that. But it all ends with him hanging himself in the basement. Okay. But that can't totally be true because he was buried with his family on consecrated ground. Which if you die by suicide, I, I don't know if this is still a thing. But because it was a... Is it a cardinal sin or a... I, I don't know the term, but yeah, I know you're not supposed to be buried within, like, a, at least in the Catholic Church. If you kill yourself, you just yeah. can't so be buried apparent... in the Catholic cemetery. Well, he's buried there, so they're saying, like, well, then he couldn't have died by suicide if that's what happened. Mm-hmm. But then other people have turned it into a conspiracy theory where, like, there was a cover-up on how he died so that he could be buried with his family. So I feel like it's people kind of like splitting hairs and like trying to make a story out of something because there's no real solid information except people saying, Oh, well this is what happened. And there's a cover up if you don't believe me also because his death certificate says that he was in declining health. Um, Mm. but then other people can argue like, well, he was in declining health and that's why he died by suicide. So, you know, I don't really, we don't really know how he died and that's what makes it mysterious, but he was buried with his family and people, for that reason, are like, no, he literally just died. Can we just yeah. leave him alone, please? Yeah. Other people who died uh, on the property, it was just James and all of the enslaved people he had on his property. Many of them were kids, and they died of yellow fever, although I'm wondering if that's a cover-up for reasons why uh, enslaved people were dying on his property. So all of the spirits happened to be uh, James descendants of him and or enslaved people after james's death the family sold the house and the building later became an antique store a bookstore became an attorney's office it became a tea shop which i like the most Mm. and it became a planter or it became planters bank which was the first bank in georgia i guess fun fact like like the peanuts yeah i don't know (laughs) i don't know i planters i don't don't know i feel like peanuts when i think of peanuts i think of georgia and then i think planters peanuts and you think of pe- you think of peanuts for georgia why i think isn't that isn't that where like as a virginian <laughs> i'm offended because we are known for our peanuts really my thought is georgia but um i maybe i'm just i'm not educated yeah, enough yeah. In, in back peanuts. away <laughs> back away Zid. leave my peanuts alone <laughs> No, Virginia is very proud of their peanuts. I have tried them. They're, I don't I don't get it. It's fine. Do you like boiled peanuts. peanuts? I do. Me too. I, I had do those peanuts in Georgia. And Coke. Do you do peanuts and Coke? I've never had that. I've heard that. That sounds really good. I, I feel like I would like that. It's very, it's very much the salty sweet situation. Yeah, I like that. It's a weird texture though because it's liquid and really hard crunchy things all at once. So it's, it's a weird mouth feel, but it tastes good. Like crunchy boba. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's like instead of boba, it's rocks, you know? Like... <laughs> <laughs> so appealing. Wow. When I think of, actually speaking of the Virginia, Georgia uh, love combo of peanuts and Coke, Coke is from Georgia. Yes. Yeah. There so I'm going to let that be where your association drifted off to. On the peanuts. <laughs> okay. 
They also uh, made Waffle House, which uh, mm -hmm. I love the Waffle House. I don't know why it's called Planters Bank. To be <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I started this weird, this weird side thing. I wonder if it's as dark as like because it was a, a plantation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't like know. Farming, planting, Not to make planter. it like so sad, but I yeah. don't know. Yeah. And what's interesting is they must be proud of that history because um, what the restaurant now in the basement is a tavern called Planters Tavern. Mm. So they've kept the name. So maybe it's not as sad as we think. If it is, Georgia needs to hold the mirror up to itself with that name. Okay, so in the 50s to 60s, that was when the house had its first real restoration. So it had all these different shops in it, but this was the first time it was getting kind of really uh, renovated, I guess. And it was sold in the 70s. Restoration continued with the new people, and it ended up becoming a restaurant in 1971. So it's been a restaurant ever since, um, from 1971 to 1992, the original people that kept it as a restaurant ended up selling it to the family that uh, now still owns it today. So since 1992, it's been under the same operation. Uh, that's uh, as of reading these notes. I don't know if there was like some sort of COVID update I didn't find mm. online, but I feel like every single story I do now, there's like, it, it might have only been owned by people by the people I'm talking about until like a year ago, you know? So as far as I know, it's still owned by the same people since the nineties. The house has survived multiple wars. It's survived multiple fires, including one fire that actually destroyed 200 buildings around it in town. So it's uh, got some strong bones. Wow. And it was occupied again by British soldiers at one point. And then during the civil war, it was, it was occupied by general Sherman's people. It was a general Sherman's headquarters momentarily. And allegedly, this house held secret meetings by, or James held secret meetings here during uh, the Revolutionary War to help the colonies gain independence. So this might have been like a little spy house, too. Wow. So please ask me why it's pink, because this is my favorite fun fact of it all. Um, what I've been wondering is, why is this house pink? Mm, it's, you know, a lot of people ask. And so uh, James, when he first got the house, it was built on really solid red bricks uh and i say solid red bricks because the bricks were so red i don't know what sort of potency was going on with them but james desperately wanted the house to be white i don't know why he just wanted to paint it white so he had red bricks and he wanted to put stucco stucco stucco, stucco all over it yeah and no matter how many layers he would put on uh the red just showed through the white and it ended up making the house look pink wow okay that's fun apparently he kept trying to like replaster stucco onto this house until he died like non-stop <laughs> and it i don't know if like maybe the 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 mix or the formula he was using like would melt with the sun or something and just it always kept letting the red shine through but no matter how many layers he put on it would always stay pink up until that was in the 1700s up until the 1920s this house was annually getting repainted white to try to keep the pink from showing through and it would never work that's some like lady macbeth shit like they're getting <laughs> that spot out and they just can't <laughs> i know so apparently this house was just ready to be pink and that's why I keep saying it like it was aggressively red bricks. Like what formula is in these bricks? Yeah. Because I feel like that should be in like makeup or something if you really <laughs> want a bold look, you know? Oh, yeah. So anyway, they ended up not having to deal with this problem anymore of painting it white through the red bricks. So then it'd be pink. In the 1920s, because a woman started working there, she was finally the owner of the building. And with her big fat brain, she was like, let's literally just paint it pink and own it. Like... Let's just own the yeah. fact that we have a pink building. Like, clearly the house's spirit wants to be pink, <laughs> and we're going to let that happen. So, in an, in an aggressive uh, display of anti-toxic masculinity, she was like, this house is pink, and we're just going to love it anyway. And after that, that was when the, the owner was a tea shop owner, by the way. Okay. So, when the house was a tea shop, it officially became the pink house versus it being, like, mocked as the pink house. 
today it has multiple dining spaces. If I'm reading that right, it sounds like there's like four different restaurants all attached to this building or at least four different dining spaces for one restaurant. It seems like the first two floors were all dining rooms. Then the basement was its own tavern. And then up adjacent to the house was another bar that was owned by the property. So it seems like there, I don't know if it was a, I don't really know what was going on. I would have to actually come to this old pink house and understand with my eyes. But it seems like there's at least one bar or maybe two bars. I'm unsure. Uh, the bar downstairs is called Planters Tavern, like I said. And then mm -hmm. the second bar, which is the one adjacent to the house, is called The Arches. So most of the stuff that people have seen is, uh, is James himself. But like I said earlier, the other spirits have been James's descendants and the people he enslaved. And by the way, this is a quick little story. We're already on the ghosts. So just to give you um, some spooky tales about this place, if you happen to be in the area and are hoping to find a ghost, keep your eyes peeled for these fellas. There is the apparition of a Revolutionary War soldier. And all of these are apparently solid as can be. You would not know that they are ghosts. So when you keep your eyes peeled... Your eyes are going to fool you, too. Uh -huh. So maybe don't actually trust Crazy. your eyes at all. The soldier is seen at the bar, uh, has literally walked up and ordered a drink, or has been seen sitting at a table and ordering a drink. He has toasted with patrons. He has... Uh, people have watched him take a drink, smile at them, and then he disappears. There is one man who recalls making intense, solid eye contact with this man, uh, so, like, they both recognize the other. And I guess one was sitting on one side of the bar. The other was sitting on, like, it was like a like a star-crossed lover's moment mm. of, like, a, across the hall we saw each other. And one of them, or the guy, the guy who is witnessing this ghost took his glass and lifted it to him and went, like, hey, uh, you know, to you. And the guy did it back, took a sip, and then because he was dressed as a soldier the guy witnessing all of this looked to the bartender to be like, who is that guy that just toasted <laughs> with me in the, in the costume? And the bartender was like, what man? Like, oh, there, I don't see anything. And when he turned around, the guy was gone. I, I'm not too familiar with Savannah, but what I've heard is it's very lovely and known for its history. So I, I and uh, I imagine if I were there and saw someone dressed like that, I think, Oh, okay. They're part of some sort of reenactment or they work yeah. in town. Uh, so I could see that. But then once they disappear, I think, oh, no, I just saw a ghost. I, I yeah. don't know how to feel anymore. That's I also anytime I'm in, I guess, like the, the south or in, on in the east coast, parts of the east coast that were like one of the 13 colonies. I'm just like, oh, you know, anything's possible. Like, mm -hmm. it's like if I see someone in a reenactment outfit, I wouldn't even really think about it, especially because Fredericksburg is like really heavy on the reenactment stuff. So I feel like I've been primed to just ignore ghostly looking soldiers. <laughs> <laughs> so who knows how many you saw not realizing and then you like looked away thinking, oh, it's just another person. I don't know. Hey, that would be pretty wild. I wish yeah. I could. I, there would be no way to know unless I had asked somebody. Exactly. I'm too shockingly introverted to, to ask about the reenactment people or I'm too, too accustomed to the reenactment people to not even mention it. <laughs> So there's that guy. He is the ghost that I would want. He didn't bother anyone. He just lifted his glass. He just took a sip and faded away. That's my favorite kind of ghost. There's also apparently James himself, where people have seen him uh, still doing like general upkeep around the restaurant. So people have seen him like straightening tablecloths or like nice. moving moving chairs around, which is so wild to me because if you, I guess for me. It's almost comforting and really uncomforting that you can see him as a solid form because it, you almost forget how creepy it is that if you're hallucinating him or imagining him, those chairs are just getting thrown around, the tablecloths are just moving around, and you can't even see how odd it looks without a person being there. It's almost like it, it's... True. I don't know how to describe it, but I feel like I would be... If, if there wasn't a person there and the chairs and tablecloths were moving as casually yeah i'd be so freaked out but only when there's a person standing there it feels less weird but then it's also wild that i'm looking at a dead man so it's kind of him to appear and show himself he's yeah. being kind and saying hey i don't want to freak you out 
but I want to yeah. do these things right now, and I want you to be able to see me doing them, so you're not too scared. I yeah, I I can't tell if I'm. I guess, I guess I'm grateful that he's giving the giving his whole apparition, so I at least know who was behind the movement. Mm -hmm. You know exactly. I do feel bad that even in death, though, he feels like he has to work <laughs> a lot. I'd be, I'd be insulted if I worked there. I'd be like, this, this fucking ghost is coming here and doing <laughs> doing my job because he doesn't think I do do it well enough? Come on. He's doing it for free? Like, <laughs> what? Like, and I'm getting paid and that's not enough? <laughs> okay, so apparently he will uh, straighten the tablecloths, he'll move the chairs, and if staff are too slow or too messy, or if they leave their post before finishing a task, they will come back and it's done for them. So again, I wonder if that's him being kind of like, oh, just my love language is acts of service. But it does feel like y you're useless, you know? <laughs> I can't tell which one it is. <laughs> Interestingly, employees have only seen him. I don't know if this is a new thing or if this is has been the haps since he died, but people only see him from October through March. Oh. But April to August, he is not there. He's on vacation. He's a seasonal ghost kind of thing, like a seasonal worker. He just kind of shows up and then goes on vacation. I love that. Actually, that's so fun. I, let's go with that. I saw some people making the joke online that he's like avoiding like the Georgia summer heat. And I'm like, well, that's also a ghost I can understand. Like <laughs> if I'm a ghost, it doesn't matter if I can't die from heat exhaustion, but I will certainly make it seem like I can. So <laughs> people also often see children in the basement, which are, we're enslaved children. Um, and they're seen in the basement, which is now the bar. So they're seen a lot in the tavern. Um, I, apparently one of their pastimes people report seeing is children throwing dice against the wall. I don't know what that means. I don't know if that was like a game they created or if that's just like a game that's just like been lost to time. And I don't know how to, what throwing dice at a wall does, <laughs> or maybe you're like gambling by yourself. I don't really, I'm unsure, but that's what people see. Apparently, they also like to play with people's shoelaces. They will untie them. They will loop them around things. They'll tug on them. So if you try to pull on your own shoelace because it's you want to tie your shoe, something will be holding it on the other end, which oh, is man. super creepy to creepy, me. Creepy, yeah. I wonder what that means or if it's just kids pranking people. But anyway, look out for your shoelaces. I like that that actually happened in the movie Casper the Friendly Ghost because it now makes, I now attribute it to friendly ghosts do that. So, Aww, yeah. Or really unfriendly ghosts who are going to like tie you to like a banister and then you trip off not down the stairs. I don't know. It could get really dark really fast. <laughs> they also, so not only do they like to prank uh, people with their shoelaces, but they will also regularly knock over cutlery. They'll knock over glasses. They'll knock over the menus. Um, they will throw wine bottles at people. That's a lot. Whole bottles. That's a little much. <laughs> it's also scary it's at how much strength they have. Yeah, oh, good point. You know? Because I feel like if you, only really powerful spirits can even muster up the strength to do that. Because on little ghost uh, equipment, if they're, if you're like, oh, can you make the light turn on? I feel like I've seen a bunch of times people ask questions like, oh, is it really difficult for you to do that? Does that take a lot of energy? And that's why the machines aren't lighting up as much as I'd like them to. Mm -hmm. And I've seen spirits say, yes, that takes a lot of energy. I don't know if that's true or if they're just, just, they're just giving me an excuse. I don't know. But if that's true, where like they can barely even make a machine light up and now there's ghosts out there just throwing heavy full wine bottles, that's a it's pretty scary at how powerful they are. This kind of makes it make more sense why, is it James or whoever it was before, yeah. is cleaning everything up. Yeah. Because these kids are causing just this <laughs> havoc. And so <laughs> James is like, okay, this is my responsibility. Like, I'm the reason these these children ghosts are here, so let me clean up after them. He really is like a like a, a parent of several children. And he's like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Like, let, me clean <laughs> let me put that away. I, it's it's not you. It's just, My kids are just crazy. Um, have you ever seen The, the Others? I have not, no. That one's trippy. That one's like a good sixth sense kind of mind-blowing thing at the end, if okay. you haven't had it spoiled for you. But it feels a little like The Others, and if you ever watch that, you'll know what I mean. Wait, maybe I did see that, now that you say that. Now that you say it. I think I might have. I, I've With been, Nicole Kidman? Yeah. 
and they're in that ho- old house. I mean, that mm-hmm. sounds like every other horror movie, but um... <laughs> there's a ghost <laughs> and it's spooky. Yeah, it's a yeah. good one though if you ever watch it, um, or if you maybe you have. Oh, uh, the employees are apparently so used to wine bottles getting knocked over or pulled out of the racks and thrown at people that they don't even seem to be phased by it. There was one person who witnessed one of the general managers watch a a wine bottle just like fly out of a cabinet by itself and she just kind of caught it and went back to work. She was like, whatever. Like, this is just my oh everyday. My God. Which is so mind-blowing to me that there are people out there who don't believe in spirits, but then there's other people who are just like, like their muscle memory is to like catch flying mm-hmm. objects at their job. One uh, worker actually their job when closing up was to blow out all of the candles on the tables. And uh, when they left for a moment, they came back and all the candles were relit. Ooh. And it was not long enough that someone could have gone in yeah. and relit all of these candles. And in a moment, this, this, for a moment, the worker was like, Oh, maybe I didn't blow them out yet. But even though the candles were lit, the candles still had smoke hovering over them from when she blew them out. Ooh. Okay. Weird. Yeah. Employees have also, just like the shoelaces, they've tried to pull tablecloths off of tables at the end of the night, and something is pulling on the other end, and then they'll check to see, like, oh, well, is it stuck on something? It's not stuck on anything, but you can see that the, the, oh, it's being like tugged that. on. Or at least you can feel it. It's like there's, like, a tug-of-war thing going on where you can, <laughs> like, something's holding on. And then I guess I saw one note that... Uh, this worker was trying to yank on the tablecloth and something was matching her strength the whole time. And eventually it yanked harder than her (gasps) because I guess she, it said that it said in this tug of war, the spirit won. And she, when she realized that it had like yanked harder than her, she like ran away, which like, duh, I would do it too. Um, But it could have also been kids pulling pranks on people. Who knows? So People also hear uh, the sound of heavy coins being shuffled around, and apparently that this was an area where gold was being handled at one mm. point. Oh, and also it was a bank, so maybe there's, like, you know, coins in that. I don't know. And so uh, near where the vault used to be, people hear their name being called by voices they don't recognize. They will see a floating light move around one of the rooms, and it will all of a sudden vanish out of nowhere. And pictures will turn out distorted at random times. So there was one picture uh, a person got of an apparition of a solid man. And then also, I don't know if it was the same picture or another picture, but it was the same person looking through uh, their camera. And they found hiding behind a chair was a little kid's face staring into the camera. Oh, no. (sighs) No, thank you. On the second floor, there is a woman seen in a scarf looking very sad and walking upstairs. And she is heard sobbing at night as the staff closes up, where they've actually thought there was a guest still upstairs, and they went looking, and nobody was there. James's son has apparently been seen around the area, and he also looks solid. He orders and pays for a beer, and people will see him walk out of the bar. I don't know if he's, like, also now holding the beer. Like, he just, like, (laughs) takes it with him out the door. But people have followed him out and have seen him head towards the cemetery, which by... It's pretty relatively early at night. The cemetery closes uh, and it's completely fenced off with an iron gate. But they will see this guy order a beer, leave the bar, head towards the cemetery. And then he will, quote, stop at the iron fence surrounding the monument where he's buried and walk right through it and disappear. Oh, just needs a beer. Have a drink, you know. He's just grabbing one for the road before he (laughs) goes to bed at night, you know. Uh, It's a nightcap. So... James's wife is also here. I don't know why. I I don't know if James's wife had like a reputation for being a nasty person in life or something, but they say this is James's wife and I don't know why or why the th- the behavior of the spirit seems similar to the wife. But I guess she hisses at you and she will yell at women in the bathrooms. And if you're in the bathroom either for too long or maybe she's in the bathroom and you walk into the the restroom, the stall doors will shake and you will hear a woman scream, get out. Oh my, okay, that's, ooh, don't like that. It's like, I don't like that. And also like, I, like, poor, if that's your wife, James, I'm sorry. But also like, (laughs) 
how do we know that's his wife? Like, yeah. wh- like was she doing that when she was alive? Just like ripping stall doors <laughs> off the handles? Some boomer was like, that sounds like my <laughs> wife must have been James's wife. <laughs> <laughs> that feels kind of like what happened. <laughs> Actually, speaking of the bathroom doors, I don't know if this is James's wife or the children playing pranks or whatever, but the spirits often lock women in the bathroom and management at one point kind of shaved part of the door off thinking maybe it warped. And so that was what was making people get stuck in there. But the door still kept sticking. And I guess after enough attempts of doing different things, management just literally took the entire lock mechanism off the door. Uh, It was like a hold the door while you squat kind of thing. And even then, when the door was completely uh, unobstructed and there was no lock on it, it would still feel like someone was holding the door shut and there was no way people could get out. Jeez. I've had that happen before. It's a really jarring experience to get locked in a bathroom that you know is unlocked Mm -hmm. and you know the door isn't disturbed at all. It's really weird because it does feel like someone is just leaning their whole body into the door and there's nothing you can do. Creepy. And then finally in 2011... Uh, There is security footage of uh, a figure floating down the hallway and then disappearing, which you can find on YouTube. And those are all of the ghosts at the old pink house. It sounds busy. It does. And that feels right for a restaurant, especially a bar. And especially in such a historic place. I mean, based on what you talked about, I mean, a lot of stuff has gone down here. So it makes sense. It makes total sense. I... I feel like restaurants often have the most activity, but it's also the Mm. most chaotic activity, which I I like that it's matching the same energy as the people really working there. But it's uh, just that it's always so kind of... I feel like half the things that happen in haunted restaurants don't even get documented because people are so focused on their own job they're not paying attention or because it's so fleeting, like, oh, a glass Mm. will break. And then it's like, well, that could have, you know... For all we know, an actual patron did that, and I didn't notice. And so I feel like restaurant stories are one of my favorites because it's very rare you get a whole set of records of ghost hauntings when so much is probably just, you know, overlooked. Totally. So anyway, I'm happy that that I found a restaurant one and a Savannah one, so hopefully you Georgians are happy for a little bit. I've always wanted to go to Savannah, and now I have another reason to. I've never been. I yeah. have also been told that I need to go. Same with Charleston, South Carolina. Yeah, yeah. Also never yeah. been there. Oh, that was fun. Thank you. You want something less fun? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had a hunch I might get it, so my expectations were low. Next one that I'm in is going to be f- a lot more fun, I think. Uh, this one, not okay. so much. <laughs> Great. I <laughs> can't wait to fun. be bummed out. <laughs> Still cry me the next one. Okay, whatever. I'll just get into this one. This one um, has a little story behind how I got into it. Because for one of my the episodes that I just did, the first one I think I did, Barch, that, uh, that one German fella who mm-hmm. uh, wasn't so good. Um, and yes. I told my dad about that, and I said, oh, I'm doing this guy. And then a week later, so we were watching football, and I brought it up again. I was like, oh, you know that that serial killer that I'm doing? And then he started singing a song. And I'm like, That's what right. are you singing? And I'm like, this is a – he's like, yeah, you know – um, Fritz Harman. I mean, that's not, he says it how a German would say it, but he says <laughs> Fritz Harman. And I'm like, no, I don't know who that is. And he said, yeah, like he was the butcher and the vampire of Hanover. I'm like, what, who are you talking about? And he sings a song and I'm like, it's like a nursery rhyme, but it's terrifying. It's typical that German. Tracks. Yeah. Yeah. Also it, it's typical Bernie. <laughs> I feel like every time anything comes out of his mouth, it, it's followed with, well, you know, and it's like, I <laughs> promise I don't. I've only met him a few times, and with certainty, I can say that's probably half your conversations. Yeah, <laughs> so true. And in in hindsight, you probably sang this to us as a kid. Um, and I looked it up, and sure enough, I found a, a video of, um, one was like a kind of a, I don't know how to describe it, like a, a fun, like big band version of it, of this song. And then another was an old woman singing it, which was very creepy. Hmm. But uh, I have the translated lyrics, oh. um, so I'm going to start with that, because this was my introduction, was this song to this guy. <laughs> so I'm going to introduce everyone the same way. I'm not going to sing you. it, I'm sorry, but uh, here are the lyrics. Okay. In Hanover, by the Leine, which is a river, mm-hmm. uh, Red Row, number eight, 
lives the mass murderer Harmon, who has killed quite a few people. Mm. Harmon also had a helper. Grunts was the name of this young man. He enticed with pleasure all the little boys. Oh. It's not, it sounds so much like creepier when it's like <laughs> German to English translation. It sounds um, so much creepier also when you are just... I think singing is what makes it seem <laughs> jolly. Because when yeah, you just yeah. tell me like, he had a helper. This was yeah. his name. <laughs> it sounds all of a sudden so much like a court document, you know? Yeah, and the, the music though too. It's all It was very fun and like lively. And I'm like, what? The? And the lyrics are just awful. Uh, <laughs> so then it says, uh, this, is, this is the kicker here. Wait, wait, just a little while. Soon, Harmon will come to you, too. <gasps> With a little hatchet, he'll turn you into ground meat. Oh. Uh, this is this is the part my dad's saying in German. I was sitting there like, what are you saying to me? Oh um, he'll make meat jelly from your eyes. He'll make bacon out of your butt. He'll make sausages from the intestines. And the leftovers he'll throw away. And wow. that is the song. So Wow. Um... I have a lot to say. Um... <laughs> Mainly, I don't know why I'm shocked because when you really look at the history of any nursery rhyme, it's so horrible. True. But I love, it's just such a good way to show how times have changed and especially in like the world of like cancel culture and humor of like, that was definitely humor from a different time where someone yeah. was like, I'm going to make this up and sing it to my baby. And like, it just the baby will grow up totally well developed, <laughs> you know? And now I think if you sing that to any children who are being raised through like gentle parenting, they'd be like, what? <laughs> like, what do you mean? <laughs> so it's a, it's a nice timeline of where we've been and where we are. I can test your theory out and uh, sing something like this to Leona and see how uh, her parents react. You know, I, you know, you and I could really conspire some real trickery there. You, <laughs> <laughs> Very you and dangerous. I could both do it at, at different times, and we'll just always make sure the baby is like at some, just a little nervous all the time. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> just see what happens. Oh no. <sighs> So, so yeah, so that's how I got, I found out about this guy. Uh, his name was Fritz Harmon. Uh, he is known as the butcher of Hanover, the vampire of Hanover, as well as, um, the wolf man. That was another one. Oh, um, of I'll get into the reasons why it'll be clear once I get into it, but we'll, we'll start at the beginning. Uh, he was born Friedrich Heinrich Karl Harmon. Okay. Uh, October 25th, 1879 in Hanover, Germany, the youngest of six children and the favorite. He was uh, spoiled by his mother and his dad, who was a railroad fireman, uh, was very strict and was also unfaithful uh, to Harmon's uh, mother. Hmm. But they stayed together until Harmon's mom died in 1901. Uh, this was kind of thrown in there, and there wasn't much information about it, but he was molested at age eight by one of his uh, teachers. Um, okay. He, like, didn't, he was very open about many things, including his crimes in the end, but um, he did, would not speak about that any further than that. Uh, he had below average grades, but was known to be very active and physically fit, so he opted to enroll in a military academy at the age of 15. Oh, he volunteered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, wow. he, he wanted to join the military, so he, he joined huh. in uh, at 15, and he did actually really well. Um, but he qu suffered from, quote, periodic lapses of consciousness, uh, oh. which ended up being likened to epilepsy. Um, so they didn't say he was having seizures specifically, but they said that that's pretty probably what it was. He chose to discharge himself, uh, putting his military career on hold, and he went back home and uh, worked in his dad's cigar factory that he had recently started. Fun. So while home, that is when, and working for his dad, that's when he committed his first uh, known sexual offenses. Uh, he would lure young boys to secluded areas, especially cellars, and mm -hmm. uh, sexually abuse them. And he was even arrested for it in July of 1896 at the age of 16. Wow, and he was sent to a mental institute in Heidel's, sorry Hildesheim, in 1897. Okay. So then he was sent back to Hanover for mental evaluation, and a psychologist said that he is quote incurably deranged. Whoa, uh, big words. Yeah, wow. yeah, and so was like lock this boy up for good, or at least yeah. for now, I guess. We're until... gonna get in, we're gonna be in trouble if we don't lock him up. Yeah. 
And uh, he was locked up for seven months uh, until, with the help of his mother, he managed to escape and flee to Switzerland, uh, where he worked as a handyman in a shipyard and lived with one of his, um, I believe, uncle, his, his mom's relatives. So he lived there for 16 months, and then at the age of 19, he returned to Hanover, where he met and eventually got engaged to Erna Lovert. I don't know how to... Lowert? I'm going to say Lowert. I'm going to say it like okay. an American would. Uh, who then <laughs> became uh, pregnant with his child. And one thing that bothered me about reading this, and based like all the sources I, I read... They just said he returned, and I'm like, this guy That's, was. I was gonna say, like, did was he only supposed to like lay low for a minute, or like, because I would never go back to, if I was already deemed like a danger to society, mm-hmm. why would I go back unless it was like some sort of like weird arrogance? Yeah, I have no idea. I I think, um, and like I, I don't know. I don't know if it's it was more of like a oh rehabilitation. So like he's been away for so long, and he was just good to wow. come back, but. I could. I read. There was nothing that I could find about him just kind of coming back and like he didn't have to report to the police or do anything. But maybe it was because he was a minor at the. He was under eighteen, and then oh, he came back. Maybe. I think he was over eighteen, so maybe that had to do with it. But he, he also totally in was the in the military by fifteen. So like, were they allowing minors? At, like, what? What's a minor at that time in yeah, that area? That was like a military academy. So I think he was. Oh, it was right. more of like you know school, but you're fo- you're going to be in the military. Um, like a, like a JROTC situation. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, and speaking of which, he actually did end up joining the military because he was it was compulsory you every person had to um and including myself when i was so i actually when i was in a senior in high school received a letter from the german government i don't know what what specifically but got a letter saying hey you're a german citizen uh, a male german citizen you have to report for uh, your compulsory military service Um, and I was here in the U S in high school and I was like, no, (laughs) Um, (laughs) I surely do not want to do that. Well, so is it, I used to assume you had to, yeah, no, what happened was my mom, um, found, so it, this was the actually last year, 2011, last year that this was required in Germany. So now there is no compulsory military service, but my mom, found out that it, it's not, it wasn't that strict. You know, if you were, mm. if you were an academic, quote unquote, like going to college or doing certain, you could get out of it basically. So my mom had my uh, school advisor write a, uh, a very well-worded letter on my high school stationery, like he will be going to the uni- uh, to a university here in the United States. It was just very like flowery to try to get out of it. And sure enough, they were like, okay. And I didn't have to give up my citizenship because that was a concern was I was worried that I'd have to give oh, up right. my dual citizenship if I uh, said no, but they were chill. Right. They were like, okay, you're good. So, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't. Did that you have to sign up for the U.S. draft though? <laughs> I did not. Oh, um, good. Okay. But actually, if I did join either military, I think if I joined the U.S. military, I would have to give up my German citizenship. That is my oh. understanding. I don't know if that's still the case or if that. I'm pretty sure that at least was the case. But uh, don't worry, though. I have no interest in joining the U.S. military. Um, <laughs> So <laughs> anyway, so that's what he was up to as well. So he was he was forced to go back into the military, um, but he loved it. That was his, he said it was the happiest time of his life was when he was in the military. He was known to be a good soldier and an excellent marksman. Hmm. But a year in, so this was 1900, and a year in, he suffered from dizzy spells, and they deemed him unsuitable for military service, and he ended up being dismissed after uh, staying four months in a hospital. So uh, his, like, dream was somewhat shattered, where, you know, this was his purpose, he felt. Well, it seems like every time he's tried to do something in the military, there's, like, a medical cause he finds out later that keeps taking him out of it. So it's... I was, anyway, keep going before I give my theories. Sorry. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so because of this, he though he did get a pension, so he was given 21 gold marks per month. I could not find out how much that was, but it seemed like, okay, like he did fine. Um, and then he went home to Hanover and lived with his fiance Erna. Uh, he began work in his dad's cigar factory again, but then the two had a 
a lot of falling outs. He ended up um, filing a lawsuit against his dad because he he said that he was uh, he was claiming he was unable to work the way his dad wanted him to because of his uh, ailments from the military, oh. and that those charges ended up getting dropped. And his dad was like, you know what? Let's turn the table. And a year later, filed a lawsuit against his son because apparently Fritz was uh, was threatening him, was threatening blackmail, was uh, gave had these there were verbal death threats between them, and he said he wants his son to be recommitted in a mental institution. Those were mm. also dropped, and a psychiatrist deemed Harmon mentally stable. So that just wow. kind of all ended. And they seemingly made up because his dad was like, here, let me set you and Erna up. I'll uh, I'll help you start a fishmongery. Uh, so this was when Fritz was what 25. What the hell was that? It's a place where they... So that it wasn't exactly clear. Some sources I saw called it a fish and chips shop. Oh. But those were like old newspapers, so I wasn't sure how accurate that was. <laughs> so I just left it fishmongery, which is a more general term for... Uh, they deal with fish. Either they sell okay. fish wholesale or uh, they just... It, maybe it's a smaller fish shop. I don't know. Okay. Okay. But the dad was like, you're 25 years old. You and your fiance need to need some help here. Let me help you open this up. And while there, Fritz was like, you know what? This, I'm, I'm, I physically cannot work. So he petitioned to get more of a pension. And sure enough, he was granted a greater pension. And he wasn't, he didn't have to work anymore. Uh, and then... Harmon and Erna had a falling out. Uh, he accused her of cheating on him, and she ended up kicking him out. And the fishmongery was in her name, so he was just kind of left to his own devices. And yeah, then he's, he, this is where things took a not-so-great turn, and he started to get into a life of crime. Uh -huh. He spent a lot of the time in prison over the next, like, ten years. Uh, he was a petty thief, a burglar, a con artist... Uh, and he also later admitted to robbing several graves, but that was never anything he was charged for. Oh, wow. So after some time in prison, he was released in April of 1918, seven months before the end of World War I. So he was in prison for most of World War I, and he moved back to Hanover to live with his sister. So World War I is relevant because with World War I ending, there was a ton of poverty, a ton of crime. It was just not a good place to be, Germany, post-World War I. Um, and Harman took advantage, though, because there were a lot of shortages on different uh, foods, supplies, etc. Uh, so he used his thieving skills to get a hold of these items and then sell them on the black market. So whether it was clothes, personal belongings. Uh, but one of the main things he did was he sold meat he would steal meat or get fake meat as i say fake because he would take meat from horses and dogs and he oh. would repackage it as like pork so oh so he it would was... falsify what it actually was to make some good money and sure enough he was making decent money by doing this got it it was not it was actual meat. it was different meat <laughs> yes it was meat. It <laughs> exactly wasn't meat you would eat <laughs> no exactly he wasn't like cooking up impossible burgers passing them <laughs> right. off as like the real thing no right okay um so yeah also things i wouldn't eat um <laughs> by the way did you hear about this it's like a getting it's becoming a little viral on the and that's where you drink community but this hufu have you heard of this i have i have the it's the meant to taste like humans and it's it's supposed it's vegan right but it it's it's it plant-based mimics... human flesh yeah, yeah. Um, um hmm i'm gonna say personally i think it's more ethical than animal flesh so i'm like Go fair for enough it if, if you want to try it's it certainly for i have addressed many times on the show that i am very very curious about the taste of human meat and not mm -hmm. that i i could not partake in cannibalism but i it just it's a general wondering of like oh i'll yeah. never know that information so it's something i'll because i'll never know it i long to to look for the information and uh it's a hey if it if we knew that it tasted the same but then i, I would go into it the same way it'd be like well who tasted human meat to know that this is what human meat tastes like very Hang on true. A second. you know very so, true anyway tangent my bad yeah would you try it you would like i it sounds like you would try it, but now that it's... I would a... try the fake one. Yeah, but yeah, I yeah. Also, that's what I meant. 
in a sick way, I think I wouldn't try it unless I knew for sure it did taste like human meat. Because the only reason yeah. I would want to do it at all was to know the taste. Yeah. Um, and honestly, I would support you trying human flesh as long it, as there was <laughs> consent there and the other person said, hey, here, try some of my flesh. We've talked um, about it before. There was a guy who had a, a, his leg removed. He had like a, he needed to go, he needed it amputated. And then mm -hmm. he requested to have it afterwards. And him and his friends had a barbecue so they could all try it together. I don't know if I, I think I would be, I would go to the party. And I think as soon as it was sat in front of me, I actually couldn't do it. I don't know if I could eat my friend's leg, but I don't um, think te I could. technically I think that I would consider that. Uh, maybe some vegans will get mad at me, but that sounds vegan because it's there's consent there. This is someone sure. who can consent to their their own meat being consumed. So uh, ethically, if, if, it, it, if can a get cow, hairy, but if a cow could go up to you and say, "Yeah, you can do this," like, would you eat a cow? Um, I probably still wouldn't eat a eat a cow. Um, for dairy, maybe. I if a cow was like, I would love for you to drink my milk. I don't know, <laughs> like it's some weird thing that they're into. If a chicken I'd is like, like, please God, eat the eggs. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, maybe. I I would. That would be at least more vegan than um than not. I think so. It, I understand maybe. what you're saying though. I don't think what you're saying is is odd at all. I'll <laughs> I'll back you on that statement. Like it. It's, hey, consent is sexy. It doesn't matter yeah. in what form it is. If yeah, you need, people. <laughs> If a chicken is saying, please, when I go, exactly. I really want to be fried chicken. I'd be like, yeah. shit, all right, I'll eat, I'll eat fried chicken. It's like breast milk. People think it's a, a gotcha kind of thing. And on, on my stream, people will be like, hey, what about breast milk? Would you drink breast milk? I'm like, yeah, because <laughs> there'd be consent there. Like, it, yeah. I would consider it. I wouldn't. I'm not, like, seeking it out. But, like, if someone was like, hey, you want to try my... Okay, this is getting weird, especially with the, it's getting the sister weird, but... who's breastfeeding. I, I'm just saying... <laughs> the. It was one of those things where I'm like, there's consent, so I would consider it. Hey, I would try my friend's breast milk. I if if I mean if Christine was like, give it a shot, I'd be like, eh, this is gonna be weird, but let's do it. <laughs> you to, know? Clar to clarify, I would never drink my sister's breast milk. I have no interest in that. Uh, this is I gonna be also terrible when have... she listens to this episode. <laughs> Poor Christine. I also don't really have interest, but if I was like, yeah. what does it taste like? And then Chrissy was like, do you like, uh, oh, there's some spilled right here. Do you want to give it a whirl? I'd be like, we can never tell anyone about this, but I, I'll, th I am thinking about it. You know, well, I, you know what? I think that sounds normal. I think that sounds normal. Um, and also to, to, to clear Christine's poor <laughs> conscience, if it were any of my friends, if it were anyone yeah. I know who was like, you want to give, I would say yes across the board, probably. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. I'm yeah, glad we let's, figured that out. Let's, let's run away. Let's move let's... on <laughs> to post-World War One Germany. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, so at this time, Harmon was a, a known criminal, um, and the police were like, oh, okay, you think like them, do you want to be an informer? Uh, and he said, sure. And the reason he said sure was because, one, it helped him get away with his crimes, uh, but also it brought him into close contact with young men who, in his eyes, would be perfect victims, whether it's because of their history, you know, their criminal history, or because a lot of them were just stray runaway youths and so it, it gave him a lot of opportunities to find victims so these were people he would offer a meal um and a place to sleep and gotcha. that brings us to his first victim who was a 17 year old runaway friedel rota uh who dis disappeared when Harmon was 38 so at this point he's 38 okay. and his friedel's friends were like yeah we saw him with the detective and Harmon would pose as a detective. So the police realized, oh, they're talking about Harmon here. So they went and they raided Harmon's apartment where they found Harmon with a half-naked 13-year-old boy. Mm. They searched the rest of the apartment but couldn't find any link to Friedel's disappearance. So they were only going to charge him with uh, what he did to that 13-year-old boy. But later, Harmon said that uh, the time at the time when he was being his apartment was being searched, uh, Friedel's head was sitting behind his stove <gasps> wrapped in newspaper. Oh my god! So it was supposedly his first victim. I think there were one or two prior that people link with him. Um, but basically, this could have put an end if they had found the head. They could wow. have put an end to uh, his future crimes that I'll obviously get into. That, um, that doesn't totally feel like it would be a first crime. I feel like it takes a lot of commitment to cut someone's head off. Like yeah. that, 
that feels like not a first try situation. Yeah, and he he did talk about how much he hated that part of it. He said that was his, oh. which he, he did not like the actual dismemberment, the butchering. That is the part that he liked the least. Uh, okay. And he said he would wow. pour a strong black cup of coffee to like fortify himself, to get himself through it. Um, All it took was coffee. It would have taken right? recreational drugs and the near overdose for me to even consider doing something like that. But okay. Exactly. And uh, it's a, he was like, oh, it took me days to recover. I'm like, it would take me a lifetime to recover if I <laughs> it would take me had to and the chop next someone into pieces. Yeah, yeah exactly. But uh, So he did get charged, though, um, with uh, sexual assault and battery of a minor. Uh, and he was sentenced to nine months in prison, but, uh, and it didn't, it didn't go into detail how he did have managed to avoid serving the sentence for a while. Uh, so he was just kind of like, oh, I'll serve it eventually. Mm. And unfortunately in that time he met his, uh, would be accomplice, uh, Hans Grantz from oh. the, from the, the song, the man from the song. Yep. Yeah. Who was an 18 year old runaway, uh, who would go on to be not only his accomplice, but also his lover. Oh. And yet Harmon said he considered Grantz like a son. Um, and yeah. he said, quote, uh, he pulled him out of the ditch and tried to make sure he didn't go to the dogs. So he had a bit of a savior complex where he's like, oh, I saved this boy from this runaway from turning into something terrible or dying by oh. taking him under my wing. And, um, yeah, I love whatever. that it's, I, I saved him from something terrible and now he's my accomplice in murder. Like, exactly. Okay. And he like was obsessed with Hans like completely obsessed saying quote i had to have someone i meant everything to oh. so he they was a it was not a healthy relationship obviously in um, a lot of ways my friend yeah, in very many <laughs> yeah. uh and so Harmon did eventually serve this nine months in prison uh was released at age 40 and of course managed to uh regain the police police's trust and he began working as an informer again and he and Grantz, uh, I don't know ever to call him Hans or Grantz. Either way, it sounds the same. So I guess I'll just <laughs> go between the two. They they moved in together, and that's when uh, the murdering really started to tick up. Uh -huh. He committed at least 24 murders. Holy shit. Uh, so this was a big time serial killer in Germany, um, if not the most prolific serial killer in germany which makes sense why he has a song that my dad is singing say, over yeah. 100 years later can you imagine in a, like finally the one thing america has done right is we don't have a song about like jeffrey dahmer like that's yeah, like, yeah. the best we got but like hey at least we've got that gosh yeah and so uh but so he said 24 murders but um or they said he was officially charged for 24 murders but he claimed to have killed between 50 and 70 people <gasps> Yeah, so he... Wow. And he wasn't sure. He was like, I think it was between 50 and 70. So after luring his victims, he would uh, rape them and then kill them by strangling them while also biting their neck, which is how he got the... Um, the vampire. The, the vampire and the wolf man uh, because he would oftentimes bite through the victim's Adam's apple and the trachea. Holy shit. So he was like, that was how he would kill them, what he would literally sometimes bite through their neck oh my god yeah. i didn't know that was actually possible i guess i guess it makes sense well i don't know i've just never thought about it that much but now i can't stop thinking oh yeah it's disgusting it's terrible um and there are the details that i couldn't even bring myself to read i was like reading them and i'm like i i don't want to bring this i i don't want to talk about <laughs> these specific things uh but that is so like core to like the the story because of sure. his nicknames and that was like you know obviously one oh. of the more horrific things uh to have to read about there, oh god there's really something so awful about the notion of anything happening to your neck i mean I, this is such an obvious statement but it holds your brain it holds your whole head up it's yeah for something that traumatic to happen it's like just one of those things you don't think about i was talking with um um kenyan about mm -hmm. uh, back problems. Uh, and like the second you throw your back out, you realize how important your back's been all along. Mm. I don't think I've ever really felt until this moment how important a neck is until you're oh I'm thinking of someone You're going through, through all it. the body parts. I'm really, I'm having a real crisis here. <laughs> okay, what's our next episode going to be? Like the, I, I, the ears? Just don't like... make it about fingernails and we'll be okay. okay? Oh gosh, okay, I won't. That, and there's that nothing like me. that in here. Ugh. Okay, okay. okay. I, 
I have a personal story I could tell, but I won't. <gasps> um, God, absolutely not. That's that's the final episode <laughs> of, and that's where we drink. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll keep it to myself dm me everybody if you want to hear about my <laughs> don't do that that's ah! weird. okay i i take that back anyway <laughs> so after pouring his black cup of coffee he would take out uh the organs he would dice them and oh. put them in buckets to be dumped in the river the lina like in the song wow and uh yeah and um one thing you know he's called the butcher and in the song, it talks about making these, making meat out of your body parts. Uh, that was a big part of this case. A lot of people, there were rumors going around about uh, how he would actually sell human meat. And that was part of what made it so shocking oh. to people. Like, oh my God, I might have eaten human because of this guy. Uh, Ooh, it's very on, Sweeney Todd. Yeah, but based on what I've read, there is no evidence to support that. They raided his apartment, and while there was plenty of blood... Uh, there was no human meat, like or meat that was being passed off as anything else. Like human meat being passed off as anything else. He um, he seems to have some some shame in uh, the the dismemberment or having or mm-hmm. after the killing. He seems to have some sort of shame. I don't know if I don't. I mean, him and me, our our morals don't match it totally. <laughs> Good but, to know. <laughs> I, but I feel like if he's dumping them in the ocean and like he's just yeah. trying to get rid of it, I feel like it would be additional work to have to like kind of sift it through a, a cooking process and all that yeah i and there was no like money making uh the reason for his killing was not to make money and was not to sell meat for money uh he actually said himself he doesn't really know why he did any of it and uh he just kind of did it and he was like yeah and, and he said when he would bite through these throats he said it was like in passion he said it was like oh um it was like a passionate thing it wasn't really meant to kill them necessarily but it's like he would definitely kill them like I, so i don't know why he would say that but he said it was more of a passion thing not, not nothing else so wow that's i mean okay no yeah. comment uh so back so back to his victims yeah so he his victims were mainly commuters uh they were or runaways uh and occasionally uh, male sex workers all between the ages of 10 and 22 uh mm. his first victim was friedel in 1918 then he killed 11 uh 11 boys and men in 1923, <gasps> 12 in 1924, and that brings our total to 24. Oh. Uh, but those were only the ones that he was able to be charged with. There were five other boys who were murdered or went missing who he was never never officially charged with, um, but he was a prime suspect. And I'm going to go through those because okay, yeah. to like kind of justify why he's the suspect. So uh, there was one boy who... Uh, Harmon wrote a letter to his school. So after the boy went missing, he wrote a letter to the school uh, saying, oh, g- giving an excuse for why he was absent for so long. So clearly he had something to do with this boy. Um, and then uh, there was a boy whose body was found with a handkerchief that had Hans Granz's uh, name on it. And oh. it was stuffed stuffed uh, in his throat. Oh, um, And wow. then there was a boy whose belt buckle was found in Harmon's apartment after his arrest. And then another, um, who he actually said Granz was responsible for. He said, oh, Granz killed this guy, not me. And then finally, a missing man whose uh, suit Harmon was wearing on the day he was arrested. (gasps) Wow, ding, ding, ding. Those are all smoking guns. Holy crap. And that brings us to what he would do after killing these victims and disposing of their bodies. He would... Uh, he would make money, but not off their meat, off of their clothes and their personal belongings. So oh. he would uh, sell their belongings on the black market, uh, and his victims' clothing were either in his possession, in Bronze's possession, uh, or in the possession of his acquaintances. Wow. And then a year later, May of 1924, at this point, no one knows what's going on. You know, boys have been missing, but no one knows who did it. Okay. And then two kids found a human skull in the river. Whoa. And at first, the police were like, oh, this might just be a prank. Just medical students throwing a, a, oh. a skull in the river. Um, wow. Do medical students do that? That sounds <laughs> a little fucked up. I mean, post-World War I Germany is a wild place, maybe. I don't freaking know. <laughs> I, okay, I wouldn't be surprised, weirdly. And then, though, a second skull turned up. And these were... Again, like boys or skull, it's between ten and twenty-two. So, mm. it, it was it fits. This, they were similar skull shapes, and they're like, oh, okay, something fishy maybe. 
Uh, and then eventually in a nearby field, a bag of bones was found and the police were like, oh, maybe we should be taking this a little more seriously. Finally, um, it only took a whole skeleton to, to really yeah. get, get going. Yeah. And at this point, there were rumors about the missing boys. So a group of citizens did choose to check the river more closely and they found more than 500 more human bones, which they turned into the police. And the police were like, okay, let's, let's search the river. Fine. Um, mm. Now that you found 500 bones. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the, boy, the bones were all of young boys and, uh, and men. So uh, Harmon was actually an obvious suspect I, because he has a history. And yet, you know, no one was looking into him before because he was an informer. You know, he had, he had very mm-hmm. close ties to the police. He helped them out. So finally, the police were like, let's put him under surveillance. And they found him arguing with a 15-year-old boy at the train station and decided to step in when things got uh, heated. And Uh the boy told the police that he had been staying with Harmon for four days and had been repeatedly raped, uh, sometimes with a knife to his throat. (gasps) Oh, my gosh. So they charged Harmon with this, with a sexual assault, took him in for questioning, um, and searched his apartment. In his apartment, they found numerous bloodstains, which he tried to explain away by saying, yeah, I'm in the, the illegal meat trade. Of course there's going to be blood in my apartment. <laughs> okay. And then they interviewed his neighbors who had seen him with many young boys. And two mm. neighbors said they saw him carrying a heavy sack down to the river and dumping something in. Um, so, yeah. Then the police took a lot of the clothes and personal items from his apartment and put them on display in the police station, inviting family members of uh, missing boys to come in to try to identify Oh, wow. Uh, any of the objects that they, they saw there. And sure enough, a lot of the missing, a lot of the items were identified as belonging to these missing boys. But oh. Harmon, again, was like trying his best to explain it away, saying that he got them from tr- either trades because he was a part of the black market or that they were left behind by sexual partners. So, oh. but Ooh. then there's one like key key um missing boy and this was robert witzel uh whose clothes boots and keys were connected to that missing boy and a friend of witzel's had said that he had seen Harmon with him the day he went missing um and his landlady Harmon's landlady was also found to be in possession of witzel's jacket and oh. witnesses said that they saw Harmon trying to remove identifying information from the tags. Oh, so be, partially because of that, because that was like a big smoking gun. They're like, "Look, this is like so clear cut." Uh, and Harmon's sister apparently was there talking to him, trying to encourage him to speak to the police and open up about whatever it was that he had done. So Harmon did finally break and confess to not only Witzel's murder but um, many of the other ones. So he just opened up and talked about everything wow so then the trials begin he was found fit to stand trial by a psychiatric evaluation and on december 4th 1924 um yeah his and hans granz's trials began so Harmon was charged with the murder of 27 boys and young men but he only was convicted of 24 of them oh okay and do we know why the other three weren't um, I think that uh, those three were also connected to Hans Granz, and there was oh, okay. conflicting uh, reports from both of them. So okay. they couldn't for sure say, oh, yeah, definitely, because they thought, sure. oh, well, it might actually be Hans who was responsible for this. But they couldn't say Hans was responsible for it because uh, he, but because sure. Harmon might have been. So uh, that's what happened there. But Harmon did plead guilty to 14 of the cases. Um, okay. And said that he couldn't verify that he participated in the other 13, uh, which weirdly, I like reading this, I kind of believed him because he'd be shown a photograph in court of a victim and he'd shrug his shoulders and be like, I don't know who the hell that is. Uh, But then he was told that he had the victim's clothes or personal items in his possession and he'd be like, oh, yeah, then it probably was me. So he was very like feel weirdly believable in that like he's like. I, I get what you mean. Where it's like, oh, well, I guess if you're that candid about it, even mm-hmm. not knowing the person, then maybe yeah. you are telling the truth. And he was weirdly insistent that the skulls found in the river were not of his victims because he said for every skull, he smashed it into pieces. So oh. like he was like, yeah, I, no, I did this terrible thing to the skulls. I didn't just throw them in there. I smashed them first. So those two skulls were not uh, related to my crimes. 
Huh. So that yeah, would be... it all, it it really does make uh, give it a more more give him more credibility if he's willing to like fess up to something else. Yeah. But then I guess he could. I don't know. Well, that that's what he was doing with the illegal meat trade. He was saying, "Oh, but I'm I'm doing this terrible thing." Uh, right. So. Right. Th- Look! Don't look at that. Look at look at me doing this other terrible thing to distract you. So, uh, th- th- but at this point, you know he's agreeing to four or what thirteen murders or f- fourteen murders. So he's like he's fucked either way. So yeah, he's like I might as well just say whatever the fuck I want. Yeah, <laughs> like, I'm exactly. Not, I'm not going home tonight. Yeah, and he had n- at no remorse, um, and he even said that if he were set free, he would most likely kill again. Well, and especially because you said he didn't even know why he was doing it, right? Exactly. He didn't so even give a motive. So he probably was definitely going to do it again. Yeah, he was like, yeah, this is what I do. And he, <laughs> he, he, he described it as like, you know, this dark feeling. He just said it was just kind of what he did. It was very, wow. like, dis- weirdly dismissive, disturbingly dismissive. Um, but yeah, no real motive. So, which is just hmm. not, yeah. So, uh, and here's a quote from him before he was sentenced. He okay. said, condemn me to death. I ask only for justice. I am not mad. Make it short. Make it soon. Deliver me from this life, which is a torment. I will not petition for mercy, nor will I appeal. I want to pass just one more merry night in my cell with coffee, cheese, and cigars, after which I will curse my father and go to my execution as if it were a wedding. Oh. So he was like, yeah, now that I did all this awful things, just kill me, whatever. Like, I don't know. It's just, ugh, this is just. I feel like had, had, I'm, I'm happy for you that you've like, like made your bed with this, but like, yo, like you're leaving a lot of damage behind. Oh yeah, exactly. Um, and sure enough, he was in fact sentenced to death. So, okay. uh, and convicted of murdering 24, uh, boys and young men. And, uh, meanwhile, Grants was found guilty of incitement to murder and was also sentenced to death. Both of them, uh, death by beheading. Oh, holy crap. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know that was an option at that point it in time. It was still a thing. Um, it was still a thing. And, um, so going down the, the Hans Grans route quick, uh, before I get back to Harmon, uh, right at the end here, um, a note was eventually found that Harmon wrote and signed and sent to Grons's dad saying that Grons was actually innocent and did not know of, nor did he help with the murders. Huh. So because of this letter, it earned him a retrial. So Grons was, had a retrial and was eventually sentenced to just sentenced to life. And then that was reduced down to 12 years in prison. Wow. Um, so after serving his 12 years, he was sent to a concentration camp, uh, Sachsenhausen concentration camp, uh, until the end of World War II, and then he returned to Hanover and lived there until his death in 1975. So, wow. Yeah. And I tried to find an interview with him. I tried to see if, like, anyone, but I, I nothing, I couldn't find anything because I thought that would be hmm. just a wild thing. I couldn't imagine living, you know, you're in the in 1970s and you were part of, like, the most famous serial killers. Um, yeah. Murder spree in Germany. And, no one's interviewing you, um, talking about, I mean, this is just, yeah. I feel like there would definitely be room for some sort of news outlet to be like, hey, now that the the main guy's gone, tell us the truth on like, or I mean, even, I don't know how the legal system works there, but like you can't, I don't know what the right word is, but you can't try someone after they've been sentenced yeah. or, yeah. I mean, at that point, like I just start talking, like if there's media interested in your story, right? Yeah, I imagine after going through that and then life in a concentration camp, if he truly didn't know about the murders and if he truly uh, was innocent to a yeah. degree, um, I could imagine why he wouldn't want to. <laughs> and, you know, that would be sure, a, yeah. quite a bit of trauma to have gone through in in, uh, in 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 a single lifetime. So I wouldn't necessarily blame him for not. But, yeah, I was surprised. I thought I thought maybe there'd be something out there. and I, not, Nothing I could find, at least. But, yeah, so... Now let's get back to Harmon and what he was up to. Uh, like I said, he was sentenced to death on the morning of April fifteenth, nineteen twenty-five, at the age of forty-five. Uh, Harmon was beheaded by guillotine. Wow. He spent his last night smoking an expensive cigar and drinking oh. Brazilian coffee, and his last words were, quote, "I am guilty, gentlemen, but hard though it may be, I want to die as a man." 
Uh, and then right before okay. placing his head uh, on the guillotine, he added, I repent, but I do not fear death. And that's it. That's, oh. that's the, the butcher of Hanover, the wolf man, the vampire of Hanover, the man my dad still sings about. Right, yeah. <laughs> Everyone's favorite tune. Um, wow. Butcher of Hanover. I don't think I'd heard of him before. You, it's. I feel like um, I'm always shocked. I don't know why, but I'm always shocked that I don't know people. If they're if they're notorious enough to have gotten a nickname, or like, mm-hmm. it's still crazy that after all these years of doing this, I there's just names I've never heard of before. But they're they clearly have some sort of infamous past. It's the fact that your dad sings about him. I, it's like. Hold on. Actually, this goes. This makes me go back to the nursery rhyme thing of like, why don't we just make nursery rhymes about happy things? Like, so true. I don't know. I don't know if anyone has ever dug into the history of nursery rhymes. That actually, maybe I'll make that as a topic one day. Ooh. But um, but yeah, pretty much any nursery rhyme you can think of has some like really fucked up history, and I don't know why everyone was just singing about that and not like, hey, today I. Got a raise. Like, why isn't there a <laughs> song that makes people happy? <laughs> so, anyway, it's just interesting science that you can say anything in a happy tune and people will listen for years and years and years. Yeah, and I, I encourage everyone to, like, go go on YouTube and check out that's the songs. There's a, a whole list of them. There's also a metal version um, of what? the song. So, something for everyone's genre of music. Um, the one I found was an older woman. The one most interesting I thought was an older woman um, who must have heard it as a child or, or sang it to her own children singing the song. So what is it called? The song? Um, I think it's just like harm the Harmon. So it's, his name is spelled H A A R M A N N. And oh. it's like the Harmon, uh, you would say lead L I E D that's song in German. So um, if you, if you type that in, you should be able to find it. Um, on... In a fucked up way. I'm surprised it's not called the harmony. <laughs> right also i still have yet to send you um my my three cd set of the bunny man True. guy I, I still need that i owe you that and everyone please go check out that bunny man cd while you're at it <laughs> if you're listening from a couple weeks back but anyway thank you so much for coming on and telling us a horrible story you said next week is going to be a little more entertain a little more okay not bad. Uh, I don't know what the right word I, is. Yeah, exactly. I don't know the right word either. Um, there is a murder involved. It is not. That's not a good thing, obviously. Um, but it deals with a, a passion of mine. So researching it was a little bit more, let's say, a little less disturbing than this one was. So hopefully, okay. hopefully people agree when they listen. I have no idea what my story will be for you next week, but I uh, appreciate you being here and putting in the work and also teaching us all a really horrific uh, German cautionary tale. Uh, You're welcome. I expect nothing less from the sheepers. <laughs> and that's why we drink. drink.